Yes, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Canon Podcast. It is now episode 25. You got the name, pause then. there. I'm not too sure why. <laughs> I was prepping myself for it. I'm like, this is new power. Oh, my goodness. Yes, we are back here with Alex for another podcast for you guys, and we hope you guys enjoy it. Make sure that you guys also... Um, uh, watch the whole video if you want on Patreon as well. If you if you wanted to uh, support the channel, that would be great. We would really appreciate it. Find the link down below. But we will get right into it because, mate, we've got an interesting game to discuss in terms of lens, in terms of how that whole game went down. A lot of, um, well, I, I don't know about overreaction because I too was quite angry. I think it was the angriest I've been on here um, after a game. So um, how are you feeling post lens? Like, is there a post lens clarity? <laughs> There's some there's something in there about lens and view and clarity. There's a joke there. Um, I'm not smart enough to make. Yeah, um, you were angry. Yeah, we do the instant reactions obviously on the on the YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, you can go check that out. But yeah, George was was pretty angry. Um, I, I, I I'm feeling more pessimistic than I have been in a while. I have to say, it's funny though because you know I've been looking at our off ball structure for a number of things this week and. I feel in many ways that um, we've actually sacrificed a lot of fluidity for that off-ball solidity. Um, and I think there are certain things that you have to do in terms of becoming a, a bit more of a mature team, in terms of finding different ways of beating teams. And, you know, sometimes you're going to have to sacrifice something. But then equally, on the other hand, I don't know whether you have to access, like, have to have to lose complete access to Zone 14 in order mm. to create some off-ball solidity. And, and, and having an on-ball identity... I think is something that I feel we're missing, and so, and so I I really do feel, and I know we're going to get into Saka later on in the in the in the in the podcast, but I really do feel without Saka we really lose an on ball identity, a way of going. Well, we know what our north star is in this game. We know how we're going to approach this. Uh, if all else fails, if we can't construct something essentially, we know there's something and there's a way of, there's a way out. And I think it's a shame because you don't want to put it all on Saka. It's not it's not on him it's you know it's it's not necessarily his fault for being so good i think we need to find some more on ball identity that was my main feeling i know we're going to probably talk about the the structural issues and i know you probably want to talk about the central access issues but you know passes into zone 14 i'm sure i don't know what the numbers are but i'm sure it can't have been more than three or four um and i know you want to talk about the blend of runners and and i went i went <laughs> Won't take your points away from you, but I, I, I did, I did feel kind of the onboard identity in terms of the bravery. There's so many different ways of getting central access. It's not just about passing in there. You can carry in there. You can create space in there. You can drop the ball in there. You can, you can cross it into that. You could. There's so many different ways of getting into that zone, and I feel as though we didn't do any of them. Um, and then that to me leads back to a level of identity and and willingness to go and win the game and willingness to to be brave on the ball. Because I don't, I, I don't want to get into percep. I don't want to get into sort of mindset and any of that. Because I, I, hopefully, people who know my analysis, it's not really my style. But at some point, when you've seen these players do that thing, when you know they know how to, they've been coached to do that, because we've seen it happen. At some point, you go, well, what's what's stopping them doing that? And and I, you know, I, I think Mikel got the blend wrong. But equally, there is a level of on-ball bravery and identity that I still feel we're missing. So it was a, it was a disappointing game. Look, in on some levels, you could chalk it up to you know we were in the middle of a story it felt a little bit we were in the middle of one of those like beautiful champions league nights where everything goes right for this plucky long who come in and whatever uh long lens loons um so you know you could pluck you could you could chalk it up to that and move on but i i do think there's some more wider issues that feel consistent across our season that cropped up uh in france rather than just putting it down to one night yeah it's um it's an interesting night because I feel while I, I've been really angry with the way that we approach that game, I think generally speaking, the result didn't really impact our season in a, in, in a sense. Like, I, I feel in the grand scheme of things, if you are to lose away in the group stage against the next best team in your group, despite you wanting to top that group, I mean, if your objectives stay the same, you top the group, you're first, you know, and, and, and we end up still being okay in the league, then I feel as though it's a meaningless game. And so I, I balance that kind of perception of mm. calm. I, I understand that. I think the one thing that I've really been critiquing, let's not beat around the bush, is that central axis issue. I think we need to discuss it because um, we've now probably played, it, it's 10 games, I think, officially now, maybe maybe 11 that we've played, including the cup game, right? So we're, we're getting a decent enough sample that it's no longer just 
well, let's wait for patience and chemistry. Let's, let's wait for, um, you know, these new partnerships to develop. I, I think that in the development of partnerships, you should see green shoots of improvement. You don't have to see the final product, but you should absolutely be seeing a plan. And right now, when you talk about identity, I think that's a huge word because I don't see one down the left-hand side. And I think it's really quite clear because a lot of people will be screaming at their mics, well, we don't have our most important player down the left-hand side in Martinelli currently, but it's not a current problem. This has been a problem that's been consistent throughout preseason and is now carried over into the season and it's now carried over 11 games. So I think it's something regardless of whether or not we have our best fixes in. And I think if we do, we become better. That's not great analysis, but it's true. It's just, is that minuscule margin of improvement fixing the problem, but axing the center of the pitch? And I don't think we are. Um, we're certainly not doing it well enough. And we certainly are doing it in a stark contrast to last season where that was one of our strengths. So uh, I, I guess I got one question for you because this whole, we've been better out of possession. Is that simply a byproduct of us attacking wide? And, and the one question I'll kind of put there is because by attacking wide, you are putting players, if there's a turnover, wide mm -hmm. as opposed to the center of the pitch. That naturally will reduce your angles in defense. That naturally will put you farther away from goal. So is it so much that we've improved the out of possession or like in possession where we struggle to go through teams? Teams struggle to get at us because the turnovers are happening farther away from the pitch, farther away from our goal. Like, is it a byproduct or is it us actually improving our off the ball structure pushing them wide like that's the one thing I'm struggling with personally like what what do you feel about that balance right now I think it's a hundred percent a part of it it's a hundred percent a part of it and I, I don't think um I don't think it's worth doing a, a, a what's it, you need to do a, well you need to do a multifactorial analysis I was trying to work out what the other one is singular factorial anyway um <laughs> you need to do a multifactorial analysis of anything really uh, as much as you can. And I don't think it can be put down to that only, but I think that's got to be a big part of it. I, I honestly though, like I feel I want to pick up on something you said, because I think it's, it's a really important thing. There will be people who are saying, well, we don't have Martinelli or, you know, we don't have this player or that player. And, and, and yeah, you're right. I mean, you're literally factu factually right, but in the more sort of um, pressing issue here, the problems extend beyond that. The problems aren't just because we haven't got this player or that player. The problem for me is about finding a different, and I will go back to it, finding a different identity when we don't have those players, when we can't, because we're not going to have them throughout the season. But also, actually, even when we have had those players, even when we played with Sacra Martinelli at certain times during the season, we've had this same issue as well. So I don't want to go too hard on it, and it's not necessarily... You know, in the same way that you're not expecting to see the finished product, you're only expecting to see green shoots. I'm also only saying the problem's only a little baby at the minute. It's not really, a, it's not a fully grown adult as a, as a problem. But I think I also feel we've got to find something. And I think I think my analysis of it is bravery. That that's my that's my feeling on the ball. I think sometimes we've seen with Zinchenko this season. I, I think Zinchenko's look really good, but I think Zinchenko for me and Vieira actually weirdly have felt like the two players, maybe because they, they, they typically pop up on that left-hand side, but they felt like the two players who feel really brave on the ball. Now, Rice is a, is a fantastic player, and I think he's going to really improve in this. But his line-breaking passes, that progressive passing, isn't, the, the, isn't the, the number one skill he has. He can do it. Of course he can progress the ball, but he, he progresses it in different ways. He carries, he he passes, you know, uh, in, a, in a different manner. So I think we are missing Thomas Partey, is, is my is my point, I think a, as a little bit um, in terms of that on-ball identity. That is an issue. But I do feel the braver players, who I would include Partey in that, are the ones that we're missing. And when those guys aren't necessarily purring, obviously Sinchenko uh, came off, I think that's when we we lose something, that ability behind the ball. You know, I was just on 77 minutes like the other night, mate. I was just going, this is over. Because there's, mm. no, there's no one that I think is going to be brave enough to take the risk because there's too many players who either don't have the the skill set necessarily, and that's not a criticism, like Tommy Asu, who doesn't have the skill set to force the issue in an in attacking sense. Or at the moment, someone like a Smith Rowe, Things aren't or habits. Things aren't quite clicking for them, and that's fine. That's their process. But Arteta needs to find something within that to to to, to get us through there. And and to me, I I will come back to it. I, not to sound like Graham Sooners. Come back to it. Um, I think it is bravery.
for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't hid my opinion on what I think we need and, you know, get your bingo cards out. Like, I really think when you struggle to go through a team, right, your your solution broadly, like, it's not even the player name, but I, I ask for carriers. Like, look at look at Manchester City, who have are a lot farther along in their process of respect, let's call it, and where teams have packed the middle against them much further. And I had this really interesting conversation on Twitter, actually, where... Um, Look, I was promoting central running power. I was promoting Emil Smith Rowe, but once somebody absolutely asked me a very good question in the sense of, well, how do City fix it? And it got me thinking, right? Because City have done this mm -hmm. for many, many years, and they've actually done it against us. When we have blocked the center of the pitch, who was the one player that gets moved from right wing down to the pivot in order to solve it? Bernardo Silva. And what is it about Bernardo Silva that helps get them out? Because they have Rodri. They have the ball-progressing monster, the so-called Thomas Partey of their team, so it's not just an issue about finding people between the lines because when they're blocked off, they also have yeah. to find a creative solution. And I'm wondering in our team, and it kind of brings me to another point that I really wanted to see, but who is our Bernardo Silva? Who is our controller of the second phase? It is Martin Odegaard. And in little glimpses we've seen, both at Lons, both at Bournemouth, mm. we've seen glimpses of him kind of receiving a little bit deeper in games. It's not something that he... I think is done exclusively, but when he does it, it works really well. And I'm seeing green shoots of improvement. And I'm kind of going back towards the Man City aspect where I don't think you need to copy the best team to be the best, but I do think that Pep has seen a need for ball carrying progressors. I look at Kovacic, I look at Nunez, I look at Doku. I look at their recruitment. They are physical carriers. And I think that that is an anticipation for the blocks that they were going to face this season. I think that when you are looking at our problems this season, and I look at the amount of actual physical ball carriers in our squad, I really only look at Emil Smith-Rowe as a physical ball carrier. I think Martin has excellent ball control. I think he can dribble. But he's certainly not somebody that I would expect to carry 10 to 15 yards in contact. He's not somebody that I think would carry us up the pitch. He does so through his passing, through his tempo, which is not bad. It's another way to do it. But I'm looking at that one tool that I'm finding our competition place a lot of value in and our coach place even less value in. Yeah. And I'm seeing the difference in terms of how they're performing this season and the difference to how we're performing this season. And there's certainly a, a choice that's being made. We can argue whether that's good or bad. It's clearly what the coach believes is the best solution. But I think Fundamentally, what I'm looking at is a team that's isolating themselves to one area of the pitch. Mm. We're not maximizing our superstars in terms of Martinelli and Bakayo Saka. And I think that we are prioritizing the eights who, for the most part this season, have really struggled to not only develop a partnership, but develop an identity within the team. Mm. So I'm with you. I think something needs to change. But maybe I'll throw it back to you on your thoughts on that, because I know that's the city solution. And I'm going to flat out just say it instead of beating around the bush. Like, do you think that Martin Odegaard as a movement to the left central midfield, similar in the way that Bernardo Silva has been used, could be an option for us to access the center of the pitch? Or do you believe we got to wait for Thomas Partey? Kind of the point I made in the instant reaction about us being really square in the pivot could be solved by having somebody more on the slant receiving. Mm -hmm. um, which solution do you think is better or is there one that's better? Well... I'm not particularly dogmatic in my view. I don't, I don't mind. I, I, I want one that works. Yeah. I don't really care. And I, and I think, I suppose maybe, to summarise, I suppose I'm saying I'd like to see more bravery on the ball in terms of the passing. I suppose you're maybe saying you want to see more bravery or, or more selections uh, in terms of the carrying. But either way, I'm looking at the numbers here. I'm looking at the volume. Progressive carries, the only player we have in the top 15, the only player we have in the top, yeah, 15, is Bukai Saka. Yeah. And in terms of progressing passes, we don't have a player in the top 15. So, you know, look, I, I, I don't care. And, and then, you know, you could say, okay, well, then we go long from the keeper. Well, David Raya's long kicking hasn't been particularly ex excellent recently. Again, we're, everyone's not quite where they need to be. So I don't mind how we get it there. I really don't. If it comes from, a, yeah. from central running or it comes from down the wing or it comes from like, pick your, pick your poison, right? But what I care about is 
when that isn't functioning. I think the Martin Erdegaard idea is a great one. Yeah, dropping him back and linking linking up a little bit. Maybe that's a bit more of a sort of mixture of the both of progressing passes and he's able, also able to carry. Do you stick with a Smith Rowe and really ask him to drive through in certain games? I don't know. I don't have a particular answer, but what, what I can see is the problem and I can see yeah. how your solution might work. I suppose I look back at last season and I say, okay, we had a, a progressive passing monster replaced him with a transition control monster who isn't quite the same in terms of the passing and we haven't we haven't gone ah well what what are we going to do when we lose that we need more on ball we need, we need uh, habits to drop back and, and and be more of a, a progressive passer or we need to pro- progress in a different way or whatever it feels like we've made a change and expected to say play the same way without the same volume of progressive passes from that deep six and that that feels to me like a fundamental issue across the season. So look, you know, Lons was a was a catalogue of things. I also want to say Lons did really well. They defended really, really well. Like, you know, let, really, let's really. be clear. Like, that we, I think sometimes we, obviously, naturally, we focus on Arsenal, so that's fine. But we we don't always, I think it, two things can be true at the same time. We didn't access the centre and we struggled to create chances. And Lons really did well to pack the centre. I can't remember their name. What is it? Lon, Lon, Lin, Lun? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree with you. And I, and I think that the fact that they're 16th in the league is massively misleading according to their underlying numbers. I mean, they also have, by the way, um, kind of the third highest line. Or no, I think it's actually the second. No, it's the second highest line in the le- in the top five leagues wow. compared to us. So wow. um, it, it's not as though that we're talking about a team that isn't progressive, that isn't able to meet teams. So... Look, it definitely was, I think, a harder game than maybe people anticipated coming in. You come into these games, and I think we're all guilty of it. I mean, I said at the top, we have to top the group. So uh, I've placed that expectation on the, on, on the team. But, I mean, I think Lons at home also have only the second best home record in comparison to Manchester City. Like, I think there's something like 18 or 19, 2-2. Two and two. They've only lost twice in the last, like, 25, 38 yeah. games. So yeah. it it is definitely a home record to kind of, you know... Uh, be afraid of in a sense but I think all in all and I'll end on this on lawns is I think that the one question I've got is yes central running power central access whatever synonym you want to go in we aren't at our attacking best I think everybody can see that I think that it's a problem that hasn't gone away I think in fact it's a problem that has steadily almost stayed the course Mm -hmm. even as we've been getting players back and I think with games approaching towards Christmas and we're still in and around of our, our objectives, I think my fear becomes when we start to lose players, because we already have, this is a long season, the solution's going to have to come at some point in this season, and I don't want to keep kicking the can down the road. I want to see a green shoot of improvement. And by the way, there was two, PSV and Bournemouth. And um, not to lean into my own per- subjective biases there, but there were particular players there that started and really helped our central access. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that they're the solution. It doesn't mean that in two games, then suddenly that's proof for them being like, they must start. Mm-hmm. But it certainly opened my eyes to confirming something that I feared. And so I'm interested to see if Mikel wants to change it. Um, and, you know, the one thing that we're all afraid of is Bakayo Saka. And that kind of transitions me into the next point. How does this team cope without Saka? Because, you know, you were talking about it earlier. You know, sometimes we just give the ball to him and expect him to solve and do the impossible. Be the flash. Do the impossible, Saka. Um, And he is somebody that I think just solves so many issues for us. He has been somebody that many opposition teams have placed Jordan rules on, where in a sense, for those that don't know, that's just a reference to the Michael Jordan, in which teams would just double, triple team him whenever he was on the court and then leave everybody else. And we see that with Saka. His gravitas is more than just a cog. And I think a lot of the... Um, issues that rivals actually don't rate Bukayo Saka as highly as he should be rated, in my opinion, um, is because it's not so much a skill. It's not so much a superstar skill. It is the fact that he makes the right decision in every moment, and he is so effective, so efficient. And we miss that as a team. When you're talking about a team that's kind of struggling with the U-shaped passing networks, typically this season, and you talk about a player that can change the tide that can really make us be efficient and click in the final third how do you think that we can cope without somebody that has such influence over our team not just this season last season but really since Mikel has taken over this is a guy by the way we haven't known an arsenal without Bakayo Saka 
for three or four years. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bigger problem than people might believe. And I don't think, by the way, that he's out for very long, but I'm just saying, in general, without a Bakayo Saka in the team, I think we're going to be looking at a bigger hole than people think. What do you think? Mm. Thanks for checking out the Canon Podcast. To hear the full episode, sign up as a YouTube member on this channel or go to patreon.com forward slash the Canon Pod.